الحمد لله الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه اللهم صل على محمد النبي الأمي وعلى آله وسلم تسليما أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم النبي أولى بالمؤمنين من أنفسهم وأزواجه أمهاتهم صدق الله العظيم in our last discourse last week, we were speaking about our beloved messenger, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And what a great favor Allah has conferred upon the believers by sending the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And we also mentioned about in light of what was happening, where at times mockery is made of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And we also pointed out, pointed out and we ended by saying that it is strange to know that over the period of time, there is only one Nabi people have chosen to do that with. There is only one Nabi from among the time of Adam alayhi salam until the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there are approximately 124,000 Prophets who came on the face of the earth. And there are those who are very famous. And there are those who are known but not very famous. Prophet Daniel was a prophet. Prophet Samuel was a prophet. Isaiah was a prophet. Ezekiel was a prophet who is known as Zul Kifli. And all these names are mentioned in the Quran. Very strange. One prophet has been the target, subhanAllah. One prophet. But Allah mentions to us, today on the face of the earth, there is only one deen and one religion stands out as the true religion of Allah. Every other religion has changed. The message in those deen and those religion have changed. The people have distorted the teachings of the prophets, their prophets, to the extent that it cannot be identified as to what really are the teachings and were the teachings of those prophets. And haq will always be, haq will always be an enemy of battle, falsehood as falsehood has always been an enemy of haq. And the fight between the truth and falsehood started in Jannah. It started in the heavens. When Adam salam was created by Allah and Allah ordered every being, the angels and who do with, with the angel, submit and bow before Adam, not to worship him. How can Allah tell them to worship him when he is given the order? But out of respect. And everybody, every species and every being at that time, they humbled themselves and bowed before Adam salam because it was an order of Allah and that order of Allah was only to show respect to Adam salam. And the Holy Quran says that everyone bowed illa Iblis except Iblis. He was from the jinns and he disobeyed Allah. From that time, disobedience started. And as soon as disobedience to Allah started, the war against Haq started. The battle against the truth started. And from that point, Satan said to Adam, he says, because of you, I was kicked out of heaven and paradise. Now you will pay, you and your progeny and your children will pay for that. And he had made a promise that he will misguide Adam and his entire progeny. And so he continues to fulfill that promise. Subhanallah. So it started there. And then when it came on the face of the earth, the battle between Cain and Abel. The battle between Qabil and Habil. The two senior sons of Adam salam. When Cain killed his beloved brother Abel. Envy and jealousy caused him to kill his beloved brother. Murder started on the face of the earth. Haq always fought against battle. So until the day of judgment, my beloved brothers and sisters, until the day of judgment, there will always be a fight against the truth. Battle and falsehood will always fight the truth. Battle and falsehood will never fight battle. You will never see... People who belong to other persuasions, religious persuasions, and other ways of life, arguing and fighting among themselves. You know, we'll never fight two of them, find two of them debating against each other as to who is true and who is false. 
the battle, the argument, the debate, the attack was always upon the truth. And in today's world, Islam stands outright as the true religion which Allah has revealed on the face of the earth. This is why Allah says in the Quran, because in his very life, the Prophet ﷺ got much more than what is being done today. The Sahabi radiallahu ta'ala and the Sahaba said, I can remember Abdullah bin Masood radiallahu ta'ala aw kama qal. He says, I saw the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam going through the gullies in Mecca. Telling the people, Ya ayyuhan nasu qulu la ilaha illallah tuflihu. Or people recite the kalima that there is no other God but Allah and you will be successful. And I saw a man behind him, pelting him with stones, pelting him with boulders. Abu Jahal and Abu Lahab pelting him and saying to the people, O people, innahu huwa majnoon, this man is mad. This man is mas'ur, he's possessed. This man has been charmed with witchcraft. Do not listen to him. Do not listen to him. Abu Lahab will say, oh people, this is my nephew, but I'm sorry to say he's mad. Don't listen to him. This is what he will hear. He's in front, they are behind. Not only the taunts, but the physical punishment also and the torture. And he wouldn't do anything. And he wouldn't say anything. And he will just keep on telling the people, listen to what I'm saying. Listen to what I'm saying. They will come and look at him and spit on his face. He will simply bow his head, wipe out that from his face, and then he will go again, subhanAllah. The Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam never ever retaliated for his own self. Never. He never ever retaliated. Never ever he did that. But his mission, his eyes and heart was focused on wanting, completing Allah's mission which he had sent him with. To bring this deen of Islam to a completion on the face of the earth. And whether it meant to give his blood and his sweat and to go days and nights hungry, starved, and if it meant to go without anything whatsoever, he did it. But he made sure and brought a perfection and completion to the deen. He left this for his ummah and he went back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nothing deterred him from that. Because my dear beloved brothers and my dear sisters, I want you to understand very well. And you can look at it based on your experience. Anytime we are treading a path which we know is good and we allow distractions to take the better of us, we will always lose focus in our life. Understand that. And distractions are meant to cause you to be distracted. This is why it is called distractions. And the life of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for 23 years, that life was filled with distractions. In one way or the other. In one way or the other, subhanallah. But he was focused on one thing. Allah has sent him with a deen. Prophets before him lived for hundreds of years and they were not able to complete that mission. He lived only for 23 years of prophethood and he completed it. And Allah says, oh my Nabi, it's time to come back to me, subhanAllah. Allah gave a seal on that deen when he said, al yawma akmaltu lakum deenakum. Oh my Nabi, for 23 years you have been propagating this deen. Today one verse will come. Tomorrow two verses will come. Another week three verses will come. One day, one part of a verse will come. After 23 years, the entire Quran was revealed. And Allah says to him, you have delivered the message. Now it's time for you to return, subhanAllah. And Allah revealed the last surah. إِذَا جَاءَ نَسْرَ اللَّهِ وَالْفَتْحِ وَرَأَيْتَ النَّاسَ يَدْخُلُونَ فِي دِينِ اللَّهِ أَفْوَاجَا إِذَا جَاءَ When the victory of Allah comes, Allahu Akbar, you, O oh my Prophet, will see people entering Islam, groups by groups, groups by groups, in multitudes they will be accepting Islam. Know that that is Allah's victory. It's time to prepare for your return to Allah. So you make istighfar and praise Allah and go back to Allah. When that surah was revealed, you know, Abdullah bin Abbas was very young. Abdullah bin Abbas radiallahu ta'ala and was the cousin of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. His father was Abbas. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, his father's name was Abdullah and Abbas and Abdullah were blood brothers. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and Abdullah bin Abbas, they were cousins. But Abdullah bin Abbas was very young. 
to the extent that when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam returned to Allah, Abdullah bin Abbas, his age was only about 12 or 13 years. Only about 12 or 13 years. But Allah blessed him so much that he was the greatest mufassir of all the sahabas and the whole ummah. On one occasion, Abdullah bin Abbas is to spend the night with, with his aunt Maimuna, and she was the wife of the messenger of Allah. And whenever the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had the time, the night to go to that wife Maimuna, Abdullah bin Abbas will make it an excuse to spend a night with his aunt just to stay with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And in the night he will sleep on the same bed with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But what he used to do, he was smart. He wanted the opportunity, he wanted the opportunity to do service for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So he knew what time the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam will get up in the very early hours of the morning to perform tahajjud. So he will get up before. He will go and bring the water for what? Wuzu. He will bring the miswak. He will take the musalla and spread it. And when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam will get up, he will ask his wife, who did this? She says, Abdullah bin Abbas did that. <laughs> and subhanallah, when he heard that, he once made a dua, Allahumma alim hu kitabak al kareem. Oh Allah, teach him the book. Oh Allah, teach him the Quran. And just you, can you imagine the dua is, is made by who? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Allah accepted that dua that he made Abdullah bin Abbas the greatest scholar of the Quran on the face of the earth. Abdullah bin Abbas radiallahu ta'ala. So Abdullah bin Abbas radiallahu ta'ala, Umar recognized how intelligent Ibn Abbas was. That even after the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam returned to Allah, Abu Bakr ruled for about two years, his khilafat. He became the khalifa and then he passed away. So when Umar became the khalifa, it was not far from the demise of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Abdullah bin Abbas was still young, probably about 14, 15 years. And Umar radiallahu ta'ala, whenever he had consultation on any issue, he will call the kibar sahaba, the major senior sahabas, who were adults and who were already all with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Those were the the what? The nobles from the Sahabas. So you will have them 50 years, 60 years of age sitting in a group. And in front of them or with them, he will call Abdullah bin Abbas, who was about 14 years of age. He will call them. Call him. So the other senior Sahabas, they had a problem with that. They say, oh, Amirul Mu'minin, we are all old big people. Why are you bringing this young boy, little boy with us? We have children also. We can bring our children and put them in the gathering. So Umar radiallahu ta'ala and said, you will see why I, I brought him. You will see why. So he brought Ibn Abbas and he put Abdullah bin Abbas sitting close to him. And he recited Surah An-Nasr. And he said to each Sahabi, who's senior? He said, tell me. What is your explanation of this surah of the Quran? What do you learn from this surah? What does this surah teach you? Everybody had the explanation. Allah has given God tidings that victory will come to Islam. Victory will come to Islam. And people will enter into Islam. And everybody said the same thing. So Umar said to Ibn Abbas, the young little boy, tell me, O Ibn Abbas, what do you think about that surah? What is your tafsir? He said, O oh, Amirul Mu'mineen, this surah predicts the death of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That is what this surah said. In this surah, Allah was saying to the Prophet, O oh, my Prophet, you have worked very hard. Islam is going to be completed now. So you will see people coming, entering Islam groups by groups, in multitudes. So when everybody will, will begin to accept Islam, know that Islam has come to an end and it is completed. Now when Islam is completed, you were sent to propagate Islam. There is no need for you again on the face of the earth. O Prophet of Allah, now it is time for you to return. So your journey of preparation, it is to what? Praise Allah was taghfir. And also do what? Make istighfar. And that is your preparation. Omar shook his head. He says, that is also my opinion. He said, everybody, say, you hear that? They all agreed. Really, it was like that because that was the final complete surah, um, surah to be revealed. After that, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, according to some commentaries, lived for about 80 days and then he returned to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, my dear beloved brothers and my dear sisters, 
We were speaking about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam with all the distractions he had in his life from his own immediate family members, subhanallah, from his neighbors, subhanallah, he never ever lose the sight and focus of what he had to do in life. Allah sent him and subhanallah, night and day he worked behind it and he gave his life for this deen which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed this whole world with. That this deen is perfect, it is complete. That millions, when it was difficult to get one person to accept Islam, when Islam was only in one home, when people had to hide their religion, when people had to hide their identity to be Muslims, they could not afford to tell anybody they were Muslims. Now today, in every nook and corner of the globe, subhanallah, the name of Islam is moving. The name of Islam is sounded, Allahu Akbar. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has done the greatest act of kindness to mankind. This is why mankind remains indebted to the Rasul of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But before that, besides that, my dear beloved brothers and my dear sisters, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was very much attached to his Ummah also. Besides the fact that he worked so hard so that the religion that we have in our hands, that we can proudly say we are Muslim, we can proudly say that our book is the greatest book on the face of the earth. We can say our Islam is the most perfect way of life. And we are happy with our deen because it has the purest teaching. He was responsible for bringing that to us. Although that is the greatest kindness, but he had a natural, physical love for his ummah. Subhanallah. How you will love another person. How you will love your son. How you will love your father. How you will love your mother. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had a natural deep love for his ummah. Although he did everything for them. On the night of Bi'raj, <coughs> he didn't forget his ummah. He was making dua and he said, May Allah's blessings and peace be also وَعَلَىٰ عِبَادِ اللَّهِ الصَّالِحِينَ Upon all Allah's servants who are righteous. Subhanallah. Allah tells us how close He was to us. He announces in the whole Quran when He says, النَّبِيُّ أَوْلَىٰ بِالْمُؤْمِنِينَ مِنْ أَنفُسِهِمْ The Messenger of Allah is more beloved to the believers, dearer to the believers than their own selves. Allahu Akbar. How dear yourself is to you? We can answer that question. How close are you to your own self? You can answer that question. Allah says in the Quran, well, if you know how close you are, you are to, you are to yourself, the Nabi, Rasulullah, is closer to you and more beloved to you than your own self. Allahu Akbar. In Surah Ahzab, Allah says, An-Nabiyyu awla bil mu'minina. He is more beloved. He is dearer. He is closer to the believers than their own self. Not only that, Look at the status he and his wives have been given. وَأَزْوَاجُهُ أُمَّهَاتُهُمْ And all his wives, they are the mothers of the believers. Subhanallah. That after his passing away, it is totally haram for any companion to marry the wife of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because Allah says in the Quran, that's your mother. Allahu Akbar. So anytime we address or the Sahabas or any Muslim address any Wife of the Rasul of Allah, they say, Ummul Mu'mineen, the mother of the faithful, the mother of the believers. Aisha, the mother of the believers, Khadija radiallahu ta'ala, the mother of the believers, Juwayriya, the mother of the believers, Safiya, all these names. Ummul Mu'mineen, Allah says in the Quran, this is why we address them with, they are the, our mothers, Allahu Akbar. They are the, our mothers. Then in another ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about this attachment and closeness that the messenger of Allah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has with his ummah Allah says in the Quran لَقَدْ جَاءَكُمْ رَسُولٌ مِّنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ Certainly a messenger has come from amongst your own self عَزِيزٌ عَلَيْهِ مَا عَنِتُمْ It grieves him It hurts him to see that you are in trouble Subhanallah Whenever he hears his ummah in trouble, he cries, he weeps. He only heard on one occasion, 
how the angel of death will take out the soul from people. And he started to sweat and cry and cry and cry. To the extent that once he asked a favor from the angel of death, he said, oh angel of death, when you go to my ummati to take out their soul, be easy on them, subhanallah. Be easy on them. Because when the soul is coming out from the body, it is one of the, subhanallah, the most severe pain a person can experience. This is why you see people screaming aloud. Their eyes are turning upside down, up and down. Their tongues are coming out from their mouth. They die sometimes with the tongue out of the mouth. mouth. They are stretching because the soul doesn't want to leave the body. The soul wants to hide inside the body. The soul runs in one part. The soul runs in another part. The soul, but the soul is coming through the neck. So Allah says in the Quran, The angel of death is pushing out his hand and say, Give up your soul. Give up your soul. Give up your soul. And the soul is hiding. The soul doesn't want to return to Allah. The soul doesn't want. You know what the Quran says? The angel begins to beat the person. Smite him on his back, on his sides. The Prophet ﷺ says, To the extent that every creation of Allah can see the bruises and see the traces and the marks of the beating of the angel, illa thakalain, except men and jinn. They can't see that. Why is the angel beating? To give up the soul. To give up the soul. And then he rips the soul from the body. To the extent that the pain that is suffered. It is so painful that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam used to make a lot of dua. Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min sakarat al-mawt wa ghamarat al-mawt. Oh Allah, I beg you to protect me from the pangs and the agonies of death. The Messenger of Allah is breathing his last. His back and head is on the chest of Aisha. He is lifting his hands saying, Allahumma rafiq al-a'la. Oh Allah, unto you is the highest. I am coming to you, O oh Allah. He's fallen unconscious, migraine headache, fever. That on one occasion, he sat in a wooden tub and threw seven large jars of water on him and still wouldn't become conscious. So much high fever he had. The Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. On his dying stage, he said, Oh Aisha, I can still feel the effects of the poison that that Jewish woman poisoned me with. At Khaybar, the effects in the body. Then he says, Ya Aisha, inna lil mawti sakharat. O Aisha, O Aisha, for death there are a lot of agonies, O oh Allah, pangs, pain in death. O Aisha, there is a lot of pain in death. And he continued and continued until she lifted his hand and then he dropped straight down to the ground. She realized he had gone back. That he returned to Allah. Right in her home, in her house, subhanallah. So when he heard, before that he heard, when the angel of death mentioned about how he takes, he says, Oh angel, please, when you come to my ummati, they can't bear that pain. Please, be easy while taking their soul. The angel of death said, Ya Rasulallah, among the believers who had served Allah well and they, had well, and they were righteous, I will take out the soul from the body like a grain of hair is taken out from the dough, the flower. So easy. You take out a grain of hair from flower, you don't feel it. He says, but for the others, I chastise them when I take out the soul. Subhanallah. So Allah is saying that this Nabi has come to you. It grieves him. It hurts him. It pains him to know that you have to go through difficulties. So much so when the Muslims in the beginning, they started to accept Islam and they were persecuted. They were persecuted. He couldn't bear to see them being persecuted, flogged every day, killed and beaten. He called them. He said, oh people, leave this land. Leave this land and leave this wicked people. Go. Go away from this land. I can't see you suffering like this. That you are following me and you are suffering like this. Leave this land. They said, O oh, Prophet of Allah, where shall we go, O oh, Prophet of Allah? At that time, the Prophet wasallam was not yet told by Allah that he should migrate to Medina. He said, go to the land in which there lives a just king. The land of Abyssinia. 
He says there is the Najashi who is a Christian king. He is a just man. Go to that land, he will welcome you. Subhanallah. And Jafar bin Abi Talib radiallahu ta'ala, the, the, the brother of Ali, Jafar, and the cousin of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, did the first migration in the history of Islam, where he, along with a few companions, men and women, they migrated to the land of Abyssinia. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Allah is saying, that this messenger is so soft to you. He loves you so much, he can't see you in pain. Subhanallah. He can't see you in pain. It grieves him. Harisun alaykum. He's anxious for you to get Jannat. Allahu Akbar. He's anxious for you to be forgiven by Allah. He's anxious for you to get goodness. Bil mu'minina ra'uf rahim He's extremely kind, compassionate. Merciful and soft to the believers. Subhanallah. Allah revealed that. Surah Tawbah verse 128. Very beautiful passage. On one occasion, Aisha radiallahu ta'ala. Aisha radiallahu What a beautiful narration. Which is recorded in Sahih ibn Hibban. Aisha radiallahu ta'ala said, She said, One day I saw the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in a beautiful jovial mood. So I said, O oh, Prophet of Allah, please make dua for me. In other words, she said, I caught him in a good mood. So actually, he's always in a good mood, but he was, subhanallah, nice, peaceful at home, not hurry, doing anything, not making haste and going to the masjid. So in other words, she could have gotten time there for him to make du'as for her. So she said, I said, oh, Prophet of Allah, make du'a for me. So she said, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam started to make du'a for her. And he said, Allahumma ghfir li Aisha. O oh Allah, forgive Aisha. Ma taqaddama min dhambiha wa ma ta'akhara. Whatever sins she may have done in the past and whatever will come after. Wa ma asarrat wa ma a'lanat. And whatever she would have done secretly or publicly. O oh Allah, forgive her for all of these things. So he made that one dua. And what happened after? فَضَحِكَتَ عَيْشَةُ حَتَّى سَقَطَ رَأْسُهَا عَلَى حِجِرِ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه she became so happy. She couldn't control her happiness. That on account of excessive happiness, her head fell on the lap of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. She was so happy, she became the most happiest to hear that dua of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, when he saw that, he said, Ya Aisha, Aya surruki du'ai, O Aisha, did my dua I made for you make you happy? Did it make you so happy? She said, Wa maliya la ya surruni duawkan. Why shouldn't I be happy? The Rasul of Allah made dua for me today. Why shouldn't I be happy? He said, Fakal, the Prophet said, Wallahi ya Aisha, inna hala da'wa tili ummati fi kulli salat. Oh Aisha, that dua I made for you, which is making you so happy, every salat I make that same dua for my ummah. Allah. Every salat, I make that same dua. That same dua that you are so happy that your head has fallen on my lap. How much more the Ummah should be happy? She got one dua and she couldn't control her happiness. Subhanallah. And Allahu Akbar. How much duas the Ummah get? Got. And then, not only that, in the hadith recorded by Imam Bukhari alayhi rahma, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Inna li kulli nabi in da'wah. He says, every Nabi was given the privilege and the opportunity to make a dua against the people, their people who cause harm to them. And all the other Anbiyas used their dua. He says, but I have reserved my dua to intercede for my Ummah on the Day of Judgment. I will not use my dua against my Ummah. When my Ummah will be suffering on the Day of Judgment, that dua that Allah has given to me, and He has promised me, O oh Muhammad, one dua you make, I will accept it, no question about it. I will use the opportunity on the Day of Judgment, subhanAllah. This was the love of Rasulullah for his Ummah. This is how much he loved us. He went in the, 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 the Jannatul Baqi, yani Al Baqi. He went to the graveyard. He went to the graveyard, and he was making dua for everyone. 
He was making du'a for everyone. And after making du'a, he stood up and he said, Ikhwani, 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 my brothers, my brothers, my brothers. The Sahaba said, O Messenger of Allah, look, we are here. We are your brothers. Why are you asking for your brothers? He said, Anta ashabi, antum ashabi. You are my companions, but I am talking about my brothers. They said, O Messenger of Allah, who are your brothers? He said, my ummah will come afterwards. They are my brothers. I have not met them as yet, but they will come in my ummah. Allahu Akbar. So much he felt for us. We can't even begin to love him as he loved us. He didn't meet us and he made dua for us. In tahajjud he will make dua. In sajra he will make dua. In the graveyard he will make dua. Every salat he will never ever leave us out from his dua. His constant dua, oh my Lord, my Ummah, my Ummah, please, please, by Abba, he never met us. How much we should love him. This is why it is not exaggeration that he said, you can't be a true believer until I become more beloved to you than your parents and your children and the whole mankind. If we only understand what he did for us, we will realize it is certainly the truth. We must love him more than everybody else. And from among the signs of loving him, Qazi Ayaz has mentioned the great Maliki scholar, very, very great scholar, who wrote one of a beautiful, fantastic book on called As Shifa. Shifa is a book that he wrote about the places where we have to recite the rood and the Prophet. Every single dua Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught you need the rood and the salat and salam and a lot more. One of the great, well accepted scholars. He says, he said, talking about signs of love for the Prophet. You know, it's very easy for a person to make a claim. But what are the signs in you that that claim is true? He said, I'lam anna man ahabba shay'an atharahu. He says, know very well. Whenever a man loves something, then he shows preference for it. If you love something, you will show how much you prefer it. He says, wa athara. Mawafaqatahu and he will prefer what that one prefers. He says, so therefore, he says, if a person cannot show preference to that person, he says, Fa in lam yakun sadiqan fi hubbihi. If he is not, then he's not truthful in his claim. Wa kana mudda'iyan, he's just a claimer. He's making a claim. He said, from the signs of true love for the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, فَصَادِقُوا فِي حُبِّ النَّبِيِّ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمُ He said, the one who is truthful in his statement and claim that he loves the Prophet is مَنْ تَظْحَرُوا عَلَامَتَهُ ذَلِكَ عَلَيْهِ is the one who shows and makes manifest and express that the signs of it. Love is in the heart. Love is in the heart. So nobody can see your heart. But there are external actions which become zahir and manifest which will show just like Iman is in the heart. But how can you show you have Iman? With your limbs. You are obedient to Allah. You are performing Salat. You are fasting. You are reading Quran. You are making the dhikr. These are external. But these external indicate to your Iman which is in the heart. And nobody will Allah can see that. So, so to love for the Rasul is in the heart. But our external actions will be signs. Through which we can show that there is love for the Prophet ﷺ. He said from Mamoun, <clears throat> the signs, وَأَوَّلُهَا The first sign of true love for the Prophet ﷺ is الْإِقْتِدَاءُ بِهِ is to follow him. Subhanallah. Allahu Akbar. That's the first sign. The question is a man who claims to love the Prophet. A question is, are you following him or not? If you are not following him, that's only a claim. There is no substance to that claim. That's the first sign. al bihi to follow him. Second, wa isti'amalu sunnatihi and using his sunnah in your life, you must bring the sunnah of Rasulullah in your life. You must love his sunnah and his ways. All his ways. Don't separate between his ways. A Muslim must never ever behave in a manner to say this is only sunnah. This is only nafil. This is only mustab. Mustab, you are degrading the sunnah of the Prophet. The Rasul of Allah, he knew that better than us. Isn't that so? Did he know what is sunnah and farz? So why did he do the sunnah? Allahu Akbar. Allah says in the Messenger of Allah, you have the most perfect example. But we who come nowadays think that we are so great in knowledge, we begin to separate. That's only sunnah. No problem with that. 
Wah, ya Allah, what type of follower is that person? The Sahabas never behaved in that manner. Never ever. This is why Allah elevated them to such a high status that they became greater than any other people on the face of the earth at their time. Subhanallah. Allah used those poor, hungry, starved people who one day couldn't have clothes to wear, who had to get, go starving for weeks, who had to go starve for days. They were soaking leaves in water to, to, to eat. Subhanallah. They had no homes. They had nothing to eat. Allah used them to conquer such big empires in the past. Allahu Akbar. Countries by countries fell to their feet. Subhanallah. Those were the people Allah used. Why? Be because they, they, they actually strictly attached themselves to the way of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he said, And following his statements and his actions, subhanallah. If he said this is so, then we believe it is so. Don't try to argue with that. Don't say, well, if the Prophet was here, he wouldn't have said that. Allah granted him perfect knowledge, subhanallah. His actions will never ever be outdated, Allahu Akbar. His actions, his ways is for all times because he is the greatest Rasul of Allah until the day of judgment he shall be followed. And also to practice on the instructions and commands he has given to us and to stay away from all that he has prohibited. When we can do these things, my dear beloved brothers and elders, when we can do these things, then we will be true in the love that we claim that we have for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We beg Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to place in our hearts true love for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because it's only when we have true love we will follow him. If we don't have true love, we will not even feel to follow him. We will just hold on to some faraiz duties and then suffice ourselves with that. But a day will come, we will be standing. And there won't be anyone to help us except Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on the day of judgment. Because the whole mankind will be running to him to beg him to intercede for them. And we will be doing that also. So if we do anything to attach ourselves with the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, then he will recognize us on the day of judgment as his followers. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala strengthen our iman and strengthen the love that we have for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And give us the tawfiq and the ability to follow all his sunnah, his ways and his practices and his teachings. Wal akhir da'wana an alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.